It's Reiki, but not as you know it. Hello, Linda. Hello. I'm so sorry. I'm a little late. <laughs> That's absolutely no problem at all, Linda. It really isn't. It's, it's fierce out there tonight. Oh, my goodness. So, this evening, I came across the Forgotten Fell to get here and was literally grabbed by the Fell Witch, who called to me and told me the most wonderful story. Whilst standing there, immersed in this story, I got completely and utterly drenched. So, once you've settled in and I have dried off and I'm not so claggy, I will regale you with the story that the Fell Witch told me. And you and our fellow travellers will have a magnificent adventure. I see you have a tipple there. <laughs> I was actually stopped outside. Uh, it's very, the, the wind is just howling out there. But do you remember the, the, the barkeep that was like kind of like a substitute the last time we got together? Well, I found out her name is Cornelia Pettigrew. And she stopped me outside just as I was putting my toes on the cobbles to, to come across. She's not in today, but she magically presented me with a little elixir in the most curious bottle Ooh. and if you look oh it is just a special what color would you say that was like that is Ooh, just that, that, an unusual color isn't it that's like a cadmium orange isn't it it is and, <laughs> and do you see that it has like a little twisted vine or twisted I don't know what it is but there's a little twisted something up the neck and I keep thinking of the twisted vine Oh! <laughs> um, she told me that this would be something I should have for today's tipple because it will really enhance our discussion about the fell witch there's a, a national drink in Scotland I call it a national drink because it's everywhere in Scotland. You never or rarely, rarely see it in England, but in Scotland it's everywhere. And it's called Iron Brew. And it's oh, that colour. Must be my Scottish blood. <laughs> yes. yes, your ancestry is beckoning to you. There you go. I'm okay brew. with that. I know, I know. It's, it's definitely that. Yes, it's perfect. I yes. love it. <laughs> And the journey from from the bottom of the vine to the top of the vine, all of the wonderful emotions that we encounter correct, along the way. Correct, correct. And she's just a little tiny thing, matches her name, Pettigrew. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I've got as my tip on today. I think it's dishwater, um, <laughs> which which having just come from the Forgotten Fell is probably quite apt because you know it was raining so hard there. I could have filled the glass full of rain <laughs> but i think i'd rather have rain water than dish soap water <laughs> well you know it gets a little bit a little bit muddy a little bit murky as life so often does <laughs> absolutely absolutely well i hope mine tastes better than yours looks <laughs> would you like some of my pond scum no thank you Oh, thank you. I'll take some of Cornelia's little magical whatever this is. <laughs> it's a beautiful colour. It's lovely. And I love the bubbles. They're really it's, it's a It's a lovely colour. Um, I'm just not quite sure if I'll be Alice in, in Wonderland, where I grow really tall or grow really small. Or I don't think it's gillyweed, but who knows? <laughs> <laughs> who can say what will happen? So, Linda, before we explore the story of the Fell Witch, let me explain a little bit to our fellow travellers who are new to the Mayfarers Inn here in Roman Nose uh, about the realms of one therapy and what these are. We could understand the realms as beginning within us, like an internal map of 
everything that we are essentially our life journey to this point and beyond all of our experiences all that we know create a landscape and when we map that landscape we can share it with the world and this ever increasing landscape that be has become communal and is shared by people in the one therapy community has become this joint sharing of stories of adventures of places of people of experiences that help us all to grow and to develop through this common compassionate and benevolent sharing of experiences this is a place of kindness uh, a place of healing a place of solitude but also a place of community and it can be a place of other things as well some people find little areas of this frustrating or a little bit scary one of the areas that i particularly love in the realm and i know linda you also have spent a lot of time here is the forgotten fell and the forgotten fell is this seemingly desolate place wide more like very often dark cast in the, the cloak of night and upon the forgotten fell is a standing stone known locally as the fell witch and this stone vibrates at a certain frequency which resonates and aligns with certain emotions within you so they come to the surface and these experiences are very often what we might call your darkness the things that you've hidden away or don't show other people that you've secreted from society and her mission if you like is to remind us that by suppressing and hiding away our darkest emotions and our the parts of ourself that we feel are incongruous we actually create mutation exaggeration we distort those parts of ourselves and we fragment ourselves whereas when we learn to love those parts of ourselves to embrace them to nurture them and to find the power within them we become a much more whole human being and very often we realize that the darkness within is actually our superpower it's actually the thing that is the most wonderful about us the fell witch has we've worked linda we've worked with the fell witch for a long long time it's so cool it's so <laughs> cool and she's very mysterious we don't know much about this standing stone but this evening as i was walking across the forgotten fell she told me her story and i'd like to share that now with our our little band of adventurers when listening to the story of the fell witch i do recommend headphones on and also don't be listening to this in a car or a moving vehicle don't be listening to this when you need to be responsible because you know if i send you to sleep <laughs> you know the rest relax enjoy the story and uh, let's take a trip with the fell witch <laughs> Pins are such little things, so innocuous and seemingly insignificant. As she sewed the soft fabric, stitch by stitch, treasuring the sensation of the sleek material between her fingers, she dreamt of such finery against her skin. The warmth of a huge banqueting hall lit by vibrant candles, the tall shadows of dancers, their capricious flickering undulation, confident in the promise of such a tender embrace. The warmth of a kind hand, an affectionate gaze, a loving caress. Yet pins are such little things that care not for dreams. And whilst they hold in place two pieces of perfectly aligned fabric, they are worth naught when it comes to clasping together a young girl 
and her love, requiring an intricacy far beyond the use of pins. The prick of a finger is such a little thing, the momentary sting that dissolves into a dull, aching pulse, a drop of blood that slowly balloons as the pin is painstakingly manoeuvred so as not to mark the creamy, buttermilk-hued cloth, and then discarded as little things so often are. Placing her finger to her lips, she gently brushed her tongue over the pinprick, tasting metal as the blood was washed away. Her finger lingered in a memory of some forgotten event, a moment of pleasure, a fleeting shimmer of a better time, when the hand of another had yet to be associated with hatred, disgust, and the darkness of human compulsion. A time when the touch of her love's skin felt so full of tenderness that she thought she might spin giddily from the world and everything in it. A time before she knew the world and everything in it. Her reverie was broken by the wail of her child, so new, yet created from an act so old. She flinched at the sound, her bond as a mother recoiling against her repugnance for what the baby symbolised. She loved the child in a way she had not thought possible, yet there was something in her eyes that reminded the woman of him. The gleam which cut through the night as he had held her down. His hand against her mouth and nose. The smell of soil and sweat and him. But such a little thing. So helpless and pure. She could not help but love her child. Regardless of the memories that flashed through her mind now and then. Provoked by her cry. Her smile her eyes. She set aside the dress, like a weeping bloom draped over the chair, petals yet to be sewn into place. Reaching down into the makeshift cot, she scooped up her child and pressed the little one close to her chest, instinctual, yet somehow distant. Closing her eyes, tired from a focus too intense and held too long. She felt the frown melt from her forehead and the pale, fragmented imagery of past events returned. Of her one love and their time together. Their stolen moments collated in some miscellany of a journey. A voyage between two people, privileged enough to find each other in a place where a love so all-encompassing is difficult to find, yet lost so easily. Snatched from her in a quick succession of sensory glimpses, a scream, a flash of skin, the taste of charred flesh, the icy cold cut of rusty iron, and that smell of the men who had taken her love and then taken her capacity to love. In reality, those moments had played out over days. From the men who came to take her away, to the weeks of cruel torture, which only ever had one outcome. The primal shrieking that sliced through the crack of contorted flames from the pyre, to the one who visited her that same night and left her with only salt for her open wound. 
Now those elusive shards of time only existed as an amalgam of neurological impulse, phantoms that came to her in these perfunctory flashes, remnants of the haunting hours. Lost in quiet reminiscence, she reflected on how the tiniest sliver of life can outweigh so many years. The heaviness of so much joy, capped with the slightest of torment. Yet how it radiates like blood through fabric. A whispered sigh, poignant, agonising, yet barely audible in the flame-tinged blackness, heralded a deeper dream and one last moment of peace before the morning brought an endless pain. Pins are such little things, so innocuous and seemingly insignificant. A single moment of careless distraction, an anguish returned for merely the briefest moment. Yet that pin grasped by a diminutive hand so curious and ready to cling to all it discovers. A torpor grown from such grief and the yearning to taste the world, to learn, to know life and the world. So much life ahead, so much world to explore the places and people, the warmth of sunlight and hungry shadows of the forest, the undulation of hills and desperate want of a love so powerful and all-encompassing that it fills life to the brim. So much life, and yet so little, all for the sake of a single pin. As the woman, who was once loved, and once a mother, woke, her eyes adjusted to the sunlight. Pouring through diamonds of dust, she pondered the stillness, the quiet, the absence of sensation where there should be life, sound, some form of kinesthesia, yet only the sanguine blush of fabric. As the horror of this scene, the situation and circumstance came together in her mind, as they danced their reality across her very being, she started to utter a noise, a wail, a howl, a guttural moan that originated deeper from within her than any word or scream or breath of passion. The sound beckoned to those nearby. It called to those who needed no excuse, but secretly desired any excuse to justify their own malice, their hatred and corrupt hearts. This siren drew them in with her soul. Those who had burnt her love at the stake forced themselves upon a woman paralysed by grief and stolen from her the innocent promise of love, life and the world. And now, for the sake of a pin, this broken creature would suffer the same fate as her love. Bereft and longing for death, she would be granted the fate she so desired. The ramshackle trial was swift and momentary in its oversight, yet seemed to last an aeon. Each wrought and twisted word spun out into a patchwork of haphazard thoughts and arbitrary musings, skewed by people rewarded for their refusal to challenge the 
cruelty of the world and of life. The pin was no longer so innocuous, the fabric not so innocent, the death of a child was not so accidental. These were not the tools and craft of a woman, desperately lonely, lost and mourning a stolen love. A mother torn, a lover bereaved, a seamstress exhausted from the ache of a life hard and callous and laced with cruelty. These were the devices and trade of a witch, a vile hag whose ways had led her to damnation and a sadistic death. The woman who had committed to this treachery of loving another woman, who lived a life non-compliant to that prescribed to all, and now of murdering a child gifted to her as antidote to her shameful ways, it was with pleasure the sentence was passed. A barbarous glee which hastily swept her from oubliette to mound. Her path from life to death expiated with an efficiency only that of human nature can provide. The journey from the village to widowers fell was only a walking distance but the multitude of steps seemed never ending to the woman who was but a girl. It symbolised the last minutes of a life so short in duration and so, so long in endurance. It as they lit each shaft of wood beneath her and the endless suffering of her life's final months united into a single moment of searing pain, something snapped into being. The vague pangs of a life hated and reviled coalesced into an emotion, a feeling she had not experienced before. Her shattered, tattered pieces were sewn together into a new garment, a robe she slipped into for the very first time. She was adored, and this unfamiliar experience was that of anger, rage, pure fury against those who had stolen, violated, and now killed her. And this new emotion tempered her steel. She crystallized every drop of acrimony into each fibre of her being, embroidered a new ferocity into every sinew, and like the gorgon deflected her gaze inwards, she allowed the flames to make stone of what was once flesh. of smoke. The villagers were shocked to see a column of petrified rock. Resolute and strong, this monolith stood, defiant in demeanour and stance. The cold grey of fire-cast stone reflected the darkness within. And this cold pillar of rock continued to stand against their hatred of anything other. 
a testament to the enduring power of those with a different story. A monument for the many who will not be tamed by the fabrications of powerful men to justify and police their own predilections over others. Each night, a strange vibration would emanate from the stone, as if struck into life like a tuning fork. This eerie song would pervade throughout the village, reminding those who were party to such an atrocity of their crimes. This is the song of the Fell Witch. She who was tormented to exhaustion by the monstrosity of others, and when that need for sleep, accidental and without volition, had caused the death of an innocent, she was put to death for the same monstrosity, the self-fulfilling prophecy of people distorted by their own hatred and dogma, the pinnacle of lies they told themselves, the lies they must ensure at any cost come to fruition. The lies, justified hard enough and long enough, so the lies become truths in the end. pierces into the darkness of all, a reminder to the hateful of the corruption eating away within, a battle cry to those crushed by hatred that you are more than you can ever know and deserve a love greater than you can ever imagine, a warning to those who turn away from their pain and need to change that it is only a moment, a fleeting moment away from the reckoning. sings and sings again to pin our truths to our hearts to pull the fabric from our veiled sight to adorn each of us within a cloak or a robe before we too are immortalized by stone
so the story of the fell witch um very powerful um i actually had to listen to it a few times um because the emotion that was pouring out of it was actually it almost felt like a physical impact almost like a shock wave um with some of the well, mostly all of it but some particular spots especially really i i just felt very affected by it um and i thought in terms of is this is this a story about now or is this a story from long ago um and so i felt myself being drawn to apply it to things that are happening right now in the environment that the world is in and yet there were other times when i felt like i was stepping back in time and being an observer of someone's trauma as they experienced it in in ways that in some respects would never happen today and yet when i had that moment of thought i realized no it's happening today still and why is that um so it was it was very emotional um and in some parts i felt very sad i felt very compassionate and other times i felt like a warrior like you know let me help how can i step in how can i soothe how can i make a better way for this situation to turn out better um again these are all definitions that are from my perspective and it made me think of the fell witch revealing those definitions that we are sometimes born with these are you know these are very karmic um we carry them with us from our ancestors they're embedded on a cellular cellular oh that's a hard word cellular level and we don't even know about them they're hidden they're buried um and then as we experience life triggers occur that wake them up or what seems like they're being awakened and yet there are other things that have conditioned us in our this now life and this is all the fell witch's realm uh, to be able to allow these things to surface and help us decipher through what do i need to address what is mine what can i heal and what no longer serves me whether that's karmic or now um that is powerful it was a it was really an amazing story to listen to for me the story represents a communication with the the essence of the fell witch and and in communication the fell witch offers a different story to to each of us and and different things to take away from 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 that story uh, for each of us one of the things for me was this sense of adornment and and the making of clothes the making of our our life's tapestry to to wear and and to adorn uh, ourselves with or to cloak ourselves with in in some cases and the stitching together of the fabric this idea of sort of pinning together these pieces for me is incredibly resonant in how we take all of these jumbled messages from life and we stitch them together into some uh, higher code um a sort of a, a sense of morality or a sense of uh, a way of behaving and in many ways these disparate pieces of fabric don't fit together and it's only the pins that hold them in place mm -hmm. and as soon as you start to sort of unpick it it all falls apart in the end of the story when the 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 fell witch uh, emboldens herself against um the the hatred of her community and uses their fire their flames to create this monumental 
statement through history that I am here mm -hmm. uh, and I and I cannot be tamed that for me was a true adornment of this sense of it you know we are set in stone uh, in our legacy so when we die um, we are we are immortalized by a gravestone and and you know is your is your stone going to be uh, a simple message to the future or are you going to sculpt your life into something more than some disparate fabric pinned together and that was a really powerful message for me that sort of that invitation to us all to actually create our own monuments in history that aren't just uh, a slab of stone right. um, with our name and our our birth and death date on it yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, it it's amazing I, you know very serious topic mm. and yet at the end i was thinking to myself hmm what kind of tapestry would my life look like if I truly could see, because I love fabric, I love textures, I love stitches, I love all, all things fabric. And I thought, huh, I would be a Victorian crazy quilt. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness it'd be something in like a fleecy fluffy fabric like a teddy bear onesie or something like that <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness <laughs> and the amazing thing is i think when exploring the realms and and going through sort of what became the home experience there is that sense of sort of going through there in exploration of of what do i want to share with people in terms of one therapy, in terms of Celtic Reiki originally, and then evolving that. And I think in terms of the adventurers going through, it's like, what do I want to learn? That relationship creates a, a, an exploration of a very specific nature. Mm -hmm. The moment you start walking through the realms, unfettered by that sort of formal training, suddenly it's like, well, you know, what, what is the history of these mystics that you meet along the way how did this place come to its name and, and sort of come yeah. to be what it is and immediately as soon as you start to put that spotlight onto these different areas that I thought I knew suddenly they expand out because you're asking different questions and you're exploring in a different way and I think sort of that combined with the whole COVID experience and the frustration of seeing people wrapped up in their silliness yeah. and, and what they believe to be important but actually isn't important and lis right, right. listening to voices that are not concerned with compassion and kindness, dignity or reverence for life and the preciousness of life. It, it, was, it was intense. I mean, I loved it. I loved it. I, I mean... I really did, but I was kind of like, okay, what's he, what's he going to say next? <laughs> oh, and, I mean, I, I don't know if you picked up on this, but sort of the fell, which for me has always been about darkness and that sort of darkness within the bits about ourselves that we lop off or bury. Oh, absolutely, ourselves. absolutely. What yeah. what do you stuff down? What do you uh, you know? How do we we maladjust in our coping mechanisms and and either buy into what someone tells us or we get the gerbil on the wheel and start saying oh 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 mm, not doing that and it goes under <laughs> and and so you know every encounter and every experience i've ever had with the fell witch that resonance of that sort of as soon as you approach her um, on the fell there is this sort of resonance there where it just starts to vibrate all of those bits and they all start to sort of have that same resonance to them and they start to sort of chime back yeah. so you become more aware of them yep. this reintroduction to the fell witch and that different perspective of connection really brought home for me the brutality of her situation and how that translates to the brutality within each of us 
that we have all experienced through life, through history, through humankind, shall we say. And I think that was something I really wanted to sort of instill within the story of the fell, which was the brutality and the yeah. suffering and, and how society, powerful organisations in society and the people in power, in, in government, for example, how they engineer these situations yeah. where groups of people are labelled in a certain way and their actions are pre-framed. So people who are this act in this way. And then when those people are brutalised, when they are disenfranchised or marginalised, through that repeated and sustained act of violence against them and attitudes that degrade them result in that very activity that has been predicted they then face persecution and a member of that group doesn't really need to do very much they do some vague semblance of that thing so people uh, got without a yourself. doubt yeah without, without a doubt and, and you know as, as always whenever i immerse myself in something you've created <laughs> it, it's it's not only percolated up stuff within me but it seems like people either all of a sudden come back into the picture or reach out and say, hey, how's it going? And, and I'm kind of like, okay, what's this about? <laughs> um, and but, but what's interesting is that they illustrate exactly what you were just saying. You know, I, I have one acquaintance um, struggles with PTSD, uh, childhood trauma. It's awful. And I've worked with him for like three years. And it's heartbreaking to see that he hasn't recognized the, the power within. And yet I hear him saying, well, you know, the mental health system that we have really doesn't work. And just that little bit of a statement, I'm saying to myself, you've allowed that label that everyone says, you've allowed that label to be true for you. Yeah. And I mean, there's numerous things like that where where people you're right they just get a label stuck on them somehow you know it's like that adhesive label that you want to get off because the jar is really cool and you want to keep it but that label just won't come <laughs> off you have to work at it you know you you really have to work at it oh um, um, sure I mean, it's, it's interesting sort of talking about ptsd there and, and one of the things that really strikes me about the fell witch is we can talk about her in terms of the darkness within and the things we suppress. And even with a sort of a de an in-depth understanding of that, we still can't quite get into that moment of someone with PTSD, for example, when it's just them and the trigger and that that overwhelming being back in that situation right and no one can reach in and to touch that moment they are in it and they are sort of trapped in that and that is the fell witch she is the one that can reach into that moment and be there with exactly. you in that moment and help you to own that moment and for me that's such a a stark realization of of her power yes. um, through the brutality that she experienced being able to reach in and and be able to sort of help others in those same moments i think is incredibly right powerful uh, yeah uh, absolutely i mean i I'm, there's so many interactions that i've had in this short span of time that i i pinpoint it all back to this like okay this is hello fell witch you know <laughs> and when when they when they say hello to me i'm like hello fell witch because <laughs> Because that's what I see, you know, I see the opportunity being, you know, is knocking on their door to say, okay, all right, have you hit rock bottom? And are you asking to break that crust? The power comes from within, you know, it doesn't implode, it explodes, you know, that, that has to come out, it has to be faced, it has to come out. It's not going to be easy, it's not going to be pretty. What's your choice? Either stay or break free and the the challenge of trauma that we experience in life so 
particularly if we go through life shattering trauma, which, mm-hmm. which sort of deeply affects us and deep and deeply lasts within us. There is that sense of allowing people to use that as a way of hitting us and stinging us and hurting us further or creating that resolve of almost making it like stone strong where mm-hmm. it's impenetrable but also uh, monumental in right. its in its legacy so that we actually create that that resolve where we can turn it into a way of helping other people mm-hmm. so it stops hurting us and actually helps undo the very thing that that, that caused it for others right right it's just it's just redirecting that power you know instead of reinforcing the stone using it to project outwards yes. um, yeah, yeah. I, again there's so many stories floating through my head you know people that I've, I've spoken to recently there's one person I was thinking of that she was criticized and labeled her entire life for being odd, for being, you know, different. Um, She has bright red hair and you'd think she's fiery and she is when necessary, Um, but she's the most, she's the gentlest, soft hearted person, always thinking of other people first. And it took her a long time to embrace all of who she is. And even now, every now and again, I can see it's like you're, you're crusting over again, you're crusting over again, that break, break that open. Because the power of wonderful things that she possesses outweighs building that stone wall back up. It's self-preservation, it's how she's learned how to cope, but she loves it when she does something for someone else. It just, you can see it, she's just glowing because she, she's notorious for going to estate sales and she knows I love shiny things. So whether it's colored glass, bottles, you name it, anything that's shiny and colorful, she'll pick up for me and she'll drop it off on the porch and just leave it there. Text me and say, hey, I, I've got a few things for you. I'm just going to drop them off. I can't stay because of, you know, the wonderful COVID times. And I always make sure I get to the door before she goes back and and drives away. And I open the packages and I'm like, I get so excited. And you can see she's, she's almost embarrassed because she, she knows how much it means to me. And there's the little trinkets, you know, there, there's nothing. They're amazing for me, nothing to anyone else, but I see her joy in the joy that she gives me. Mm. Um, I love that. I mean, it's, it, I love the shiny, colorful things too. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the point is, I love seeing that part of her because it's, it, she's normally very tough on the outside, um, except those little few moments where I can say, oh, there, there she is. There is the true her, you know? Yeah. I think one of the big themes in the, the Fell Witch is this sense of the other, which can mean many different different things to different people. And many of us feel like the other. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't necessarily fit in with the constraints and the labels and the definitions of who we should be in life. And, mm-hmm. and as- we don't aspire to the things that make um, a sense of normality for other people. <laughs> and there is that that sense of people who touch the other who are of the other their superpower is very often empathy mm. because what they experience and how they suffer at the hands of others and and just the the sharp jaggedness of the world against them very often soft-heartedness it creates this this sense of I don't want anybody else to experience this. I don't want anyone else to suffer in this way. Oh my goodness, yes. And that that empathy that that pours from people who are of the other is something that is extraordinary. It it cannot be forged in the heart of a classroom. You can't teach it. No. You can't you can't sort of teach empathy to other people. No. It's only through going through the fire 
um, mm -hmm. of, of that suffering that that, that empathy comes about right. and so many people who are of the other in whatever way that that is interpreted have this experience of being so diminished by the world yes. that they do begin to cover over that empathy oh, just, to, just to protect themselves yeah. to oh it's definitely safe. protection measure no question absolutely no question. And the fell witch says, you know, own that, own yes. that suffering, own that pain, own that darkness within and just let the empathy flood out. Because if you feel like the other, then there are others who are like you who need to hear that message, right. who are alone in their rooms, in their homes, right. out on the streets. They are isolated and and feel completely disconnected from the world and they need to hear your voice ringing through that and being able to talk directly to them right. through that resonance that that yeah. sound that the fell yeah. witch makes i i i like the phrase being part of the other that that's that's like a tribal thing you know <laughs> i really like that <laughs> i think i think anybody that that, that partakes in one therapy um or a reiki modality or anything like that it can, can sort of say that they're, they're at least a little bit other <laughs> and are very often treated as other you know whether that be in terms of uh, a skeptical sometimes pseudoscientific mindset yeah. where people say oh no that's that's not scientific there's no scientific proof whilst right. actually having no scientific proof themselves to be able to make that statement. Right. So there's that side of it. But then there's the other side as well, the more dogmatic side, who treat people within our own community as other uh, mm -hmm. or as different. And then there's the world at large, which very often will just look at the things that we do very heartfelt, genuine, compassionate things that we do. And they would just look at that as being strange. So I do think that we are very much of the other. Yes, happily so, <laughs> happily so. And, happily you know, so. I talking about when you gen, genuinely outpour whatever support, information, help, whatever, whatever is coming out of us, I've often found it a little disheartening. Not only do people downplay it, but also say it's not real. Mm. You know, that's not genuine. You're not being genuine. And, and isn't that the world's way of saying, don't feel, don't, don't feel, don't express because there's no place for that. It's only cut and dry, black and white. And we all are subject to that. You know, we, we all daily have conditioning memes that come our way and we have to choose like, okay, what are, what are we going to allow in to build? And unfortunately, there are many times because of past traumas that it gets a little messed up. And when, when these triggers come, we don't see them as opportunities to step forward and, and break free. We allow them to continue to build the stone. That's fascinating to me because, I mean, we all do it. It's not an us and them kind of thing. We all do it depending on the day, depending on the weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some things hit us not so good. Some days it's great. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> but but it's, it is very, I think, wonderful when you can speak with someone or a group of people, and we may come from all different aspects of whatever those traumas may be or difficulties, and yet there's a connection, there's a click, there's a, they understand me, mm -hmm. they get it. And, and vice versa, like I can't talk to anyone else about stuff like this, let's just say. And, and they say, I know, and this is why these conversations are so good because you can't just talk to anybody without them potentially looking at you like you're crazy or <laughs> you're destitute to reality or something, you know? <laughs> when we are in conversation with people encountering the influences of the world that trigger our need to react or our want mm -hmm. to react or our, our compulsion is that it's all very language based and the domain of the fell witch is beyond language 
there's a, a certain point where we can talk our way to the very frontiers of of her uh, of her realm but mm-hmm. then there comes a point where it is much more sensory it's a sight or a sound or a feeling or a sensation oh gosh, yeah. Yeah. and and it's in that moment that the real trauma is locked up because we can rationalize things you know if 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 we are abused by somebody we can rationalize it we can we can self talk our way around that both into that trauma and away from that trauma we can justify the need to suppress and to push right. down but it's not until we start to unlock the experiences that exist beyond words the the feelings of being in that moment the sensations the the sensory input that our brain is processing that create this sense of traumatic paralysis mm-hmm. It's not until we access that that we stop locking it away and suppressing it and pushing it down and we begin to work through it and not just to sort of overcome it but to actually take on that mantle and use it mm-hmm. to make a better world to ensure that you know no one in our sphere of influence is abused in that way right. or, or traumatized by abuse for example so I think it's so powerful not just to take on the viewpoint of I'm going to talk my way through this where I feel comfortable about it. Yeah, I think it is about that deep level work that the Fell Witch accompanies us with, that we go through and we really work with that and we use it to, to make a better world. Right. Ever since the first time I encountered the Fell Witch, that has been a favorite place to go visit. And I remember, you know, some of the others that were studying at the same time were really freaked out by the Fell Witch. And they were like, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> and I thought there was something wrong with me. I'm like, whoa, but this is really, this is really a good place for us to be. Like, it's really good. And it was like, nope, nope, nope. can't make me do it. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's okay you know it, you you do have to be at a point where you're ready to take that step forward and there's no criticism or judgment if if you're not ready to embrace that but as soon as you open the door a little bit the universe has a way of kind of shifting things around where you're taking a look outside and lo and behold, you may see and experience some things that you didn't expect. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. yes, yes. But it's good. It's all good. I say that repetitively, but I don't know if that's partly my trying to convince myself. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, no, seriously, it, it's almost a, a propellant. You know, if you keep making those steps forward, even if they're baby steps, um, it propels you. It keeps pushing because you can't go back. But, you know, that's one thing about all of this is that once the light is shed on something, you look at it from a different perspective. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, in relation to the trauma that someone may experience, I, I think in terms of, okay, that trauma is buried and labeled and configured in such a way that has built been built up over years you know especially childhood traumas as you grow as you mature as you become an adult and have other experiences that trauma gets defined many 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 times i do absolutely believe that the pain and the suffering and the and the the hard experiences the challenges challenging experiences we have in life they meet us at a point in our being in our in our psyche where our best qualities our superpowers our, our ultimate strengths are and they connect in that moment so not only are you going into a trauma to unlock that trauma and and to use it as a way of bettering the world you're also unlocking the finest qualities of yourself the the things that make you you 
and inherently you that no one can mimic or duplicate the things that are authentically your birthright right. and they're all bound up so heavily in that place because that is the place where they they come together and and know each other that really we need to go through that exploration when the time comes for us and that's why for me the fell witch is so important and so powerful and meeting her and embracing her is this sort of wonderful journey because she is your guide through that and she can't be lovely fluffy filled with light to get where she needs to take you and so that thing that some people can feel quite frightened and and have this trepidation around her is something that I think in some ways is perhaps a misunderstanding of who the fell witch is mm -hmm. in as much as she is this, uh, this source of empowerment. Right. Um, she's not frightening or scary to the other, to the people who want her help and need her help and sort of find their way somehow to her. She embraces all that find their way to, to the fell and, and, and to her empowerment and, and I think that that for me is a really important aspect of the fell witch is that she can go to those places and guide us to them with a sense of strength and a sense mm -hmm. of that sort of inner steel that we need to be able to do that. The, the inner steel that's within mm -hmm. that has been put in the shadows and hidden, cloaked. You yes. know, you are you going to cloak over and become invisible? Are, you know, it's an ongoing joke. My husband claims that I have an invisibility cloak because sometimes I can be out and about and no one sees me. <laughs> yep, 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 snap. <laughs> me too. But, but, how, but how interesting, though, when, when we just use the two terms, are you going to cloak or are you going to put on a robe? And, and that robe, obviously, is going to be outstanding. You know, a robe demonstrates confidence and empowerment. You know, a, am I going to embrace this trauma cloaked or am i going to put on my robe and face it head on in the book the key which is personal and business development based on in part the facets of uh, key uh, from shintoism and uh, touched upon in reiki modalities and there is this sense there of do we have a cloak with which to hide ourselves away and hide our superpowers away or is it a robe that we use to adorn ourselves do we present ourselves through our our sort of uniqueness and our authenticity in the world or do we sort of try and cover that and hide it away and this is another one of those self-fulfilling prophecies when you have people who are very distinct in the way that they look and they present themselves in a way that, you know, is truly who they are. They've, they've, they've invested a lot of time and lived a lot of life to get to the point where they can be truly happy with themselves and present that. And then when they look different and they are bullied or they're abused or they're shouted down or they are in danger of sometimes being killed you know, mm. or death and and people say well what well, why are they why are they provoking it why why don't they just live their lives and sort of you know not not look like that not dress like that not behave like that right, and there's right. this sense of why don't they just hide from the world <laughs> and people that are very sort of distinctly themselves in life they don't do it because they want trouble they're doing it because they want to be authentic right. and it is the world that is actually denying their authenticity that is the problem not the person that is presenting in a way that is different to the expected right. or to, to the usual right the, yeah. the the definition that we all get labeled with mm. most of the time is not accurate to who we truly are and and, and any sense of adornment it, is very often seen Yes. As a provocation. Oh, absolutely. Just a, a, an expression of oneself. Absolutely. In it's in all realms. How you dress, how you look, the facial expression, your hair color, your piercings, your tattoos, your whatever. The list is ongoing. Um, it's It comes down to perception. You know, people 
people are no different than the others um, in that they fall into the same hooks yeah. and and triggers because we we all come with stuff you know they and until we're ready to face the stuff <laughs> <laughs> um it, it's each individual's responsibility to be true to themselves I'd be really interested to um, sort of explore your journey with the Fell Witch um, from sort of your first encounter with her to how that relationship has grown and evolved over time. That's a long time ago and lots of water has flown <laughs> under the bridge. <laughs> um, well, you know, Timing is timing is perfect. Um, when I first encountered her, honestly, it was kind of a whirlwind, if I recall correctly. I I I like dark things, and, and it's, it sounds wicked, but it's just the opposite of what everyone else thinks. So of course I'm going to choose something dark and spooky. Yes, come this way, <laughs> <laughs> because I never look at things like everybody else, and so I'm not. I don't fall into the oh it's dark and gloomy and scary it's trouble it's bad nope it's just your perception um so i think that's kind of where i was the very first time i went to visit the fell witch it wasn't until the next round of going through the realms that i almost felt like she was saying okay now you had your fun the first time <laughs> come on up <laughs> and it was a, it was a difficult time it was a lot of lots and lots of family trauma had percolated up dysfunction like i never realized um just was bubbling out of the pot uh, so visiting the fell witch at that time was i don't want to say scary but i knew okay, this is going to be intense because I need to work on what's within. Didn't matter what was going on on the outside, although it was pure chaos and I felt the effects of that chaos. I knew that I had to be brave, climb the path, get to the top of the fell witch area, wind howling, all sorts of feelings percolated up. Um, so to your point about what the fell witch does, it's about feeling those emotions, mm -hmm. not the circumstances, not the chronological events, not the time others involve, so on and so forth. It was more about how do you feel about this? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to show you something and I want you to look hard at it and what come what comes to mind um it was tough it was tough there were lots of tears there was lots of anger there was lots of swearing <laughs> Not you linda i'm shocked <laughs> <laughs> but i think that was the beginning of a wonderful relationship with the fell witch because after having gone through it like for a week visiting uh the fell witch I started to realize like, you know what? I'm feeling a little bit lighter about all this. I'm, I'm, I have better direction. Mm -hmm. I have better understanding of what is mine and what is not mine and what I can release and what I can own and didn't change anything. You know, the circumstance this today, all these many, many years, the family is still pretty messed up and dysfunctional um, yet how I react and how I act is completely shifted. And those in my circle of others, those relationships have become so much stronger because we share, we can identify the, the pain and the emotion that the trauma caused, the triggers that, ha that occur, that still occur. I know how to deal with them. I'm not taken out at the knees anymore. I'm not saying, uh, please, universe, don't try, don't test me on that. <laughs> but generally speaking, I might, I might have, you know, the, the wind taken out, you know, I may gasp at a circumstance or a trigger, but it's, it's not, 
it doesn't bring me to my knees anymore. And and that's the fell witch. That that's the fell witch is doing by bringing you to that point. You know, I think so clearly about in the home experience how we're instructed to put our hand on the cold stone. It's very sensory to me. You know, I can feel that. I know. I mean, I I love to hike, so I'm outside a lot, and I'm in outdoors is you know, any season kind of thing. So if you're a sensory type person, being outside is like the best <laughs> because everything hits you. Um, it can be a little overwhelming sometimes, but but to, to put your hand on cold stone, it's like electricity, you know? And in the Fell Witch, that's what it felt like. It was like power surge. It was like connecting to something that wasn't the stone, wasn't outside of me, it was within, which helps the whole transformation process of breaking away that stone structure that we build. You know, the more we struggle and try to keep everything in a nice little box, those things tend to grow. And anything that's in a little container eventually starts spilling over. And that makes me a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so I would rather embrace it all and just let it expand because then it's manageable. Mm -hmm. We keep trying to suppress. It's going to keep trying to get out. Sort of much of what you've described there is, is sort of the way that um, I experience her too in that sense of it's very much within you know, we can we can understand sort of the world around us as being external to us, mm -hmm. but we are always mapping the world around us into ourselves and mapping ourselves onto the world around us. So there is this this communicative process that's always going on, and that touching of the stone, the fell witch uh, stone on on the forgotten fell, is very much this sense of touching the darkness within ourselves mm -hmm. and reaching into ourselves and finding that. And one of the things that is particularly powerful about that, um, which I, I, I know that you also feel, is that when you touch it within yourself, you can see it in other people and experience it, feel it in other people. So sometimes through their behavior or their actions, whereas it would invite you to react in a way that is counter to that or um, that, that is co at conflict with that behavior. When you recognize the fell witch in somebody else, you recognize that they are acting from a place of pain and suffering, right. not from an intent. They don't mean to hurt you. It is a reaction to the trauma that they are carrying with them. Right. And as soon as that happens, there is this instantaneous connection between the fell witch within them and the fell, fell witch within you. And it gives you that common ground. And she acts as a, a guide and a companion in that healing relationship together mm -hmm. that, that you make where they reflect your darkness and you reflect theirs. But together with her help and with her sort of support on that journey, you can both heal and get to a point where that trauma becomes your superpower right what what i find so extraordinary in terms of relationships across generations and particularly the relationship between parent and child in as much as again we have these ideals these labels these concepts of what the mother is and what the father is and what a, a dutiful son or daughter or, or child is and there is this constant pressure to strive to that ideal and so as children we are given these ideals of the, the parental figures and very often they don't match our in, in, in experience and reality they don't match what we have been told they need to be yeah. and in the same way as you know, parents um, want children that aspire to certain things. And when we don't aspire, uh, we don't often get the approval that we are so um, desperate for. Right. 
And I think so many of us grow up with that disconnect and that distortion between the want, very basic want to be loved and to be accepted yeah. and to be cherished as human beings by our parents. And then that slow drip, drip, drip of realization through life that actually, no, we're, yeah. we're not appreciated for who right. we are. The, the archetype, the ideal for who we should be or who they want us to be is very often evident. But if we just simply cannot be that thing, there is this sort of terrible schism within us where we feel, you know, what have I done? And it is that interesting thing when we sort of take a whole life from birth to death and that sort of concept of the tombstone that is left behind and is a definition of us that encapsulates our whole life from birth to death in terms of the dates mm. and in terms of the relationships to others maybe even a statement to some quality that we had but it never truly demonstrates and presents who we are right. as a person in all of our living moments right. and all of those things that we really truly authentically were not the definitions that were placed upon us right. and the only person in our lives who has the capability to transcend those parental expectations and child expectations is ourselves. I have a very deep rooted acceptance of anyone who's different. I don't care what it is. It, it doesn't matter to me the way you look, your gender, your orientation, it does not matter. And I mean that wholeheartedly. That raises something very interesting for me, which I think is sort of a core element of the Felwitch story, in as much as that sense of otherness, and certainly in terms of the queer community, who are utterly, desperately in need of something greater to give context and meaning to their lives mm -hmm. but they are denied that by traditional forms of religion or spirituality by traditional organizations who say no this is not for you unless you unless you fundamentally change right. and that's one of the things for me in terms of one therapy and in terms of therapies like the reiki modalities um, uh, psychic abilities etc these therapies are a very powerful tool and a very powerful experience for people in the queer community who are looking, they're seeking for something that has been denied them because mm -hmm. of inherently who they are. Mm -hmm. And that acceptance uh, within the realms and, and that utter non-judgmental, in fact, celebration of who Absolutely. they are is utterly fundamental to everything that we do yeah. and for me the fell witch is symbolic of that precisely <laughs> powerful I, I almost said a bad word but powerful stuff <laughs> <sighs> right i think i've just about finished my pond scum <laughs> yes and and my little bubbly elixir is gone as well so um i guess it's time to say goodbye um thank you everyone for joining us uh, i hope you en enjoyed every moment um i hope especially that it's made you step back and say hmm what does this really all mean to me so i'd say until the next time we meet let's all just remember be enchanted. You've been listening to the It's Reiki But Not As You Know It podcast, hosted by Martin Pentecost, originator of One Therapy, and Linda Hadzinski, guide and companion to the One Therapy community. Find out more and join in the conversation at onetherapy.com.
1-therapy.com It's Reiki, but not as you know it.